my channel. My name is Louisa. If you're new, welcome. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you're coming back, welcome back. So today's video was hotly requested by one person, but <laughs> it's a really interesting subject. And strangely enough, the request to explore Psalm 82 happened to coincide with me actually watching an almost five hour lecture series from Dr. Michael Heiser. So I will actually link that particular lecture series. Um, I've got a playlist. So I'll link it in the description box underneath and you can check that out at your own leisure. It's been segmented up into four sections. So today I wanted to talk about how Psalm 82 is related to Pentecost and in particular to the gift of tongues. In the book of Acts, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is characterized by the speaking of tongues. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So this applies first to the Jewish people as it was promised by God, but then later on it begins to include the Gentiles. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. These are two specific instances of the gift of tongues, but throughout the rest of the book of Acts, tongues is a really prominent feature of salvation and also the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's such a defining feature that there are a bunch of hypercharismatic churches today, which basically preach that you're probably not saved unless you have the gift of tongues. Now, this is not really accurate. I know lots of perfectly saved, spirit-filled Christians who have never spoken in tongues. It's not necessary. So I think the question that we really need to be asking when it comes to things like the gift of tongues is why? What purpose does it serve? Does it have an actual function at that particular time? What does it mean? What does the gift of tongues symbolize? So to make sense of why the outpouring of the Holy Spirit featured the gift of tongues, at least initially, we kind of have to know two really important things. Number one, the gifts of the Spirit are distributed by the Holy Spirit as he sees fit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So a lot of people see the gifts of the Spirit as displays of power, which they are, they do testify to the power of God, but they're not arbitrary. They actually do serve a particular function. God is above all other things, very purposeful and very deliberate. He doesn't do random stuff. So if we know that this alludes to something deeper, then the answer probably lies somewhere earlier in scripture. And this brings us to the brilliant work of Dr. Michael Heiser, who is an expert in ancient Semitic languages, and in particular, his book called The Unseen Realm. Now, The Unseen Realm is pretty much a collection of peer-reviewed, 
papers put into a coherent narrative that kind of teases out an overarching theme and an overarching storyline. So he kind of goes through all of the little breadcrumbs that are distributed throughout scripture, especially in the Old Testament. And he has a look at the picture that they build. If lots of academic papers don't particularly tickle your fancy, then he actually has a different version of the book, which he's called Supernatural. And it's a slightly more digestible version of Unseen Realm. A peer-reviewed textual analysis of ancient Hebrew is not everyone's jam. But the answers that he and all of these other ancient language scholars have managed to tease out from the scriptures is this overarching theme of God's plan for salvation of humanity and how it actually works. So point number one was that the gifts of the Spirit are not arbitrary. They are deliberately portioned out by the Holy Spirit. And the second thing that you need to understand is that Pentecost, and in particular the gift of tongues, is reversing Babel. So what actually happened at Babel? Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city, and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Well, just before the account of Babel, we actually read the Table of Nations. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So Babel was another rebellion against God. In Michael Heiser's work, he talks about three separate rebellions from not only the unseen realm, but also from humanity. So the first one was the Garden of Eden. The second one was chapter six of Genesis, which was just before the flood. And that was what resulted in the Nephilim. And then the third one was Babel. God gave the command after Noah and his sons disembarked from the ark that they were to be fruitful, multiply, and spread across the earth. They were supposed to repopulate the planet. Instead, the descendants of the survivors of the ark decided to build a city. So this was the very first city after the flood, and it was built in the plain of Shinar, which is where Babylon ended up being. So in the Bible, Babylon is like this shorthand kind of description for humanity trying to be their own gods. And Babylon started with Babel. The Tower of Babel wasn't just a tower in the middle of nowhere. It was part of a greater complex of a city. And if you think about cities as a particular phenomena, this is something that I've studied in psychology. One of the units that I did was how nature impacts us psychologically in a very beneficial way. There is a growing body of research in psychology trying to figure out what the mechanisms are which makes exposure to nature so beneficial to us as human beings, not just psychologically, but physiologically as well. 
From my perspective as a Christian, this is a fairly obvious one, which I will get to very shortly. But as you can see, multiple research papers, peer-reviewed, all talking about how beneficial nature is on mental health as well as physical health. Like, basically we cannot live without it. We are embedded with these mechanisms which require nature. And from my perspective, this is God's way of ensuring that we come back to him at some point. On the other hand, if we are surrounded by the concrete jungle, then we tend to get really depressed and very stressed. Cities are a humanist concept. They testify to the dominion of man and they testify to human accomplishment. They also push away any conscious awareness of God because as we see in the book of Romans, nature testifies to God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. So nature testifies to who God is. It testifies to his glory, and his creative power, and his magnificence, and his beauty. And if we spend time out in nature, then we are reminded of that. And it also helps us to feel closer to God. Cities are the opposite of that. Cities are us divorcing God. And we divorce God by divorcing our dependency on nature. So if you compare something like a skyscraper to a mountain, one of them testifies to man and the other one testifies to God. If you think about the arduous and tenuous nature of living off the land, it's very different to all of the convenience and sanitization of the city. In a city, you can be surrounded by millions of people and yet not know a soul. It's the sort of environment that fosters a cutthroat, greedy, vacuous, shallow kind of expression of humanity. And we do end up suffering psychologically from it. So that was Babel. And it's interesting what God said about now nothing they propose will be withheld from them. If you think about things like the technological boom and the industrial revolution, that's pretty much what happens. Cities are where humanity seeks self-reliance. And in the end, we usually appoint other human beings to some kind of deity or godhood. Christianity, on the other hand, teaches us that we need to be reliant on God that we need to seek his wisdom and that we need to place our faith and trust in him rather than in ourselves. So what did God do in order to handle Babel? Well, he went down, confused the languages, and then he appointed them to different heavenly hosts in order to keep the nation separate. Dr. Heiser calls this the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And it's not found in every translation of the Bible because our understanding of what they knew back then was lost in translation. One of the places where it was actually preserved was in the Greek Septuagint, which is actually older than the Masoretic text. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect and all his ways are just a faithful God without deceit, just and upright is he. Yet his degenerate children have dealt falsely with him, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and senseless people? 
Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old, consider the years long past. Ask your father and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of gods. The Lord's own portion was his people, Jacob his allotted share. And that's the scripture which definitively calls them angelic hosts rather than the sons of Israel, because Israel didn't exist back then. So God appointed heavenly host over each nation. And these are the principalities and the powers and the rulers that we read about in Ephesians. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So what happened? How did they go from being the appointed heavenly host of God into being the rulers of darkness and wickedness? Well, now we come to Psalm 82. And this is where human beings go back to our usual thing of trying to turn ourselves into gods. The New Age is very fond of John 10, 34, because it says to their inflated ego that they are gods. I am a god, you dull creature. Puny god. You're not god. Okay, that's the same lie that caused the fall in Eden. And the Jewish people that Jesus was talking to at the time, they did not have that idea in their heads that they were gods. They were actually trying to kill him for saying that he was the son of God. Even just saying that he was the son of God was the height of blasphemy and that was punishable by death. So let's have a look at what Psalm 82 actually says in its entirety. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Okay, now we have a clearer picture of what the fallout was from Babel. These sons of the Most High, these little g gods, the princes and rulers of darkness in heavenly places. These guys are real. Zeus, Osiris, Hades, Satan, Set, Poseidon, Shiva. This is not mythology. These are real entities and they rebelled against God. Instead of looking after humanity in a just and caring way, they grew corrupt and stole glory for themselves. These are the tricksters of old, messing with humanity for their own amusement. You'll notice how Psalm 82 ends. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. And there's another psalm which also talks about a similar thing. Psalm number two. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. 
Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. There's one thing that you really have to understand about God in order for all of this to make sense, and that is that he is holy. So if there are cosmic laws in place that he has set into motion, he cannot transgress them. And he cannot make exceptions for those who do, which is why we are all under condemnation for sin. Everything has to be done above board and by the book, which is why these heavenly hosts have rights and they know it and they exploit it. They exercise these rights frequently by bringing charges against humanity. They're actually seeking our destruction. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, pagan practitioners are keenly aware of the concept of territorial spirits, because it's true. Let's have a look at some passages in the books of the kings to see just how important this really is, to see just how important actual dirt is. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious, and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him. And he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then if not... Please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. One of the things that people often forget about in the Genesis story of how human beings were made is that we were formed out of the earth. We are dirt, which sounds really bad. But in many respects, it makes us territory. So there is geographical territory and there are elements of that territory, such as the earth and the rocks, which can be taken from one place to another. And that has a form of spiritual significance to it. And if you're sensitive to the spirit realm, which a lot of people who were in the new age, or maybe you still are in the new age, I don't know, 
But people who are sensitive to the spirit realm, they often stumble across places which have an unseen intelligence to them. And it's not your imagination. That is a real entity. In the old days, they would have been referred to as fairy circles. If you're Irish, they're still referred to as fairy circles. But the thing is, these entities are not your friend. They are the tricksters. So how did God take back the nations? Well, he formed a brand new spiritual kingdom. This is the kingdom of God, which Jesus spoke about repeatedly in the gospels. And it's here, but not fully here yet. It exists in a spiritual dimension. It supersedes physical territory. How does it manage to break free of geological boundaries, geographical boundaries? Well, one of the key characteristics of national identity is language. And that is how Pentecost reversed Babel. It broke the language barrier. Jesus made the atoning sacrifice on the cross. He made it possible for us to be reconciled back to God. He declared victory over the principalities. And then he instated his kingdom. This is Mount Hermon in Israel. And in the foothills of Mount Hermon, right at the very base, is a town called Caesarea Philippi, where something very interesting happened in the Gospels. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. This is Caesarea Philippi at the base of Mount Hermon, where Jesus and the disciples had that conversation. And these are the gates of hell in Caesarea Philippi. Michael Heiser in his works points out that this entire conversation happened exactly just before the moment when Jesus started informing his disciples that he was going to be crucified. How did he know he was going to be crucified? Because he had just declared war in front of the gates of hell. According to the apocryphal book of Enoch, Mount Hermon is the location where the fallen angels mounted their rebellion. Now this is the rebellion of Genesis chapter 6, which resulted in the Nephilim. But essentially, this mountain is enemy territory. And Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he declared war on the enemies. What else did Jesus tell the disciples in the lead up to the crucifixion? Well, one of the major events was the Olivet Discourse, where the disciples asked Jesus what would be the signs of his return and the signs of the kingdom of God coming to earth. And once again we get a clearer picture of what he's talking about in regards to nations. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Well, in 2018... The scripture was fulfilled. The gospel has officially been preached to every nation, which means that every principality and power in the spiritual realm has been given their marching orders. John Chow from America, he knew exactly what he was doing when he set out to try and reach the people of North Sentinel Island, who were officially the last uncontacted race of people. 
and he explicitly wrote to his parents that he was probably going to die. He knew the risk when he set out. No doubt, the Holy Spirit had told him exactly what was going to happen. And he did it anyway. And that is what it means to be one of the royal priesthood. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So now you are no longer bound by either the geographical gods or your ancestral gods. You can now choose to be part of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom knows no language barrier. God's kingdom knows no geographical boundaries, which means that it's not necessary for us to display the gift of tongues anymore because that was already taken care of. All right, guys, hopefully that was helpful. Once more, if you want to check out the full lecture series or if you want to buy Michael Heiser's books, I will link that in the description box. Many thanks to his decades of research. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.